Today I'd like to talk to you about a topic which at first sight you might know well that's not really all that intriguing, I know everything about that anyhow, so it may be a nice refresher. Well, of course it is a nice refresher, I hope, but it's a lot more than that because what I'm trying to do in this sermon and the next one is to show you and talk to you about certain events in Jesus' life when he came here as a man, when did they take place? In what context did they take place? At what time of year did they take place? In what year did they take place? And you will see, I believe, a tremendous connection. A connection, perhaps, which you might not have seen before that clearly. The first question I want to ask is, when was Jesus born? What year was he born? What time of year was he born? Now, some of that is clear to most people who have been in the church for a long time. Maybe so clear that some have lost that knowledge and have begun to come up with other concepts. When was Jesus born? Now, in one of our many Q&As and booklets on this topic, we say that we note, of course, that Joseph was going to be taxed. Taxation would come just after the fall harvest. It's time of the fall harvest or the fall festivals, which is Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and the great, last great day, and of course the Feast of Tabernacles. It was always just after the fall harvest, when tithes were paid to the priests. Makes sense, because you see, they didn't have any money before that. So they, they had to do the harvest first, and then they had the money. And so the Romans knew that, so they taxed them right after that. And history records show that those taxations always took place at the end of the fall harvest, which was sometime in September or October, a logical time for taxation and travel. And on top of that, of course, we know that at the time of the year, shepherds were in the fields with their flocks, and this is a time of year when Palestinian shepherds take their flocks into the field to graze at night. They wouldn't do it in December. It was far too cold in December. It was a rainy month, the worst of all the months, so they would never have the sheep outside in the field. But it matches with September, October. Now that's something we all should understand. There's also more proofs you can give based on the time when the priests did their courses. But I don't want to go into that one, that's kind of technical. But what year was Jesus born? In what year was he born? Now that's all kinds of discussion, even in the Church of God. Now we have always understood, or we should have, and we have been teaching that consistently, that he was born in 4 BC. 4 BC. Before King Herod died. I will come back to that in a moment. He was six months younger than John the Baptist. Or you could turn it the other way. John the Baptist was six months older than Jesus Christ. Turn with me please to Luke chapter 1 and verse 36. Luke chapter 1 and in verse 36. Here's the angel announcing to Mary that she is now pregnant, would become pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And then he says to her, now indeed Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, talking about John the Baptist, and this is now the six months for her who was called barren. And of course then he says, you know, because for God nothing is impossible. So John the Baptist was older than Jesus Christ, apparently six months older, which is important because later on he would say that Christ was before him. Now, Christ wasn't before him in the flesh, proving that John the Baptist understood that Jesus Christ existed prior to his birth as a human being, which is again important because some even in the Church of God at one time started to believe and to think and to teach that Christ didn't exist prior to his birth as a human being. Since we are in the book of Luke, let's look at Luke chapter 1 and verse 34. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, 
since I do not know a man. What she's talking about is she didn't know a man in the sense that she had no sexual relationship with a man. So she said, how can I be pregnant? I didn't have any sexual relationship. Now she was married to Joseph, but the marriage hadn't been carried through yet. They were betrothed. They looked upon as husband and wife, but they hadn't carried it through yet. And so she said, well, I haven't had that relationship yet. How can I be pregnant? But you see, later Mary brought forth other children. Joseph and Mary brought forth other children, which means that Jesus Christ had brothers and sisters. Again, a big, huge church, the Catholic Church, denies that. But notice Matthew chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1, verses 24 and 25. Now also the angel comes to Joseph and tells him the same thing. And Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife, so Mary was already looked upon as his wife, and did not know her. All right, so they still didn't have sexual relationships till, until she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus. So only until Jesus was born didn't they, quote unquote, know each other. Afterwards, they did, which is again confirmed in Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, verses 54 to 56. In Matthew 13, verse 54, and when he had come to his own country, he taught them in the synagogue so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son, Joseph? Is not his mother called Mary, and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, and his sisters, are they not all with us, indicating at least three, maybe more? Where then did this man get all these things? So clearly he had half-brothers and half-sisters through his mother Mary. And so then we read that when Jesus was 12 years old, he was found in the temple after the Passover. And you read that in Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 41. Luke chapter 2 and verse 41. His parents, in other words, Joseph and Mary, and this is the last time that you hear anything about Joseph. The last time he is mentioned as being alive. So it appears like that sometime after this event and before Jesus became and entered his public ministry, Joseph died. So here we see that his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. So Jesus Christ kept the Passover with his parents every year. He knew when the Passover was. And it goes on to say, and when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. And when they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother didn't know it. And of course, then they find out later, thinking first that they had been with their relatives, and then they go back, and they find Jesus in the temple. And then the mother is a little bit upset, saying, what are you doing here? Did you not know that we have sought you anxiously? Verse 49, he said to them, why is it that you sought me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? And they didn't understand the statement which he spoke to them. But we read that Jesus went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. His mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor of his God and man. So and then after that, we hear nothing about him for a long time until he enters his public ministry. Now let me just give you the fact and then I'll go back and show you from the Bible why I say these things. Jesus began his public ministry with his baptism which occurred in October of 27 AD. His ministry lasted three and a half years. He was about 30 years old when he began his public ministry. 
So he was 33 and a half years old when he died. How can I say that? Now, let's go back with me, please, to the book of Daniel, chapter 9. Because in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, we find a remarkable prophecy which confirms pretty much everything I've said. Daniel, chapter 9, let's start reading at verse 24. It says here, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end or to purge away sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street will be built again, and the wall, even in troublesome times, verse 26, and after the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but, but not for himself. Or a better translation would be, but without guilt. And then dropping down to verse 27, well let's keep reading verse 26, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, the end of it shall be with a flood, until the end of the war, desolations are determined, verse 27. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Now as we have pointed out in our literature, and as we are pointing out in our brand new booklet on biblical prophecy, this is a prophecy which has to do with the first coming of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. You might want to look at some commentaries later on, for instance, like Haley Bible's commentary clearly makes this point, the Rive Study Bible makes this point, many other commentaries make this point. What is talked about here is that a decree would be given to rebuild Jerusalem. Now most understand that that was a decree which was given by King Artaxerxes to the Jews to go back and to rebuild Jerusalem which was given in 475 BC, 400, I'm sorry, 457 BC, 457 BC. Now if you look at the seven weeks and the 62 weeks, in other words, 69 weeks altogether, and when you understand that in biblical prophecy, a day is like a year, and you have this, for instance, in Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6, you are having 69 weeks, but with a day like a year and a week consisting of seven days, you have, four, you have 483 years. Now if you count 483 years, beginning with 457 BC, recognizing you don't have a year zero, you come to 27 AD. 27 AD, when the Messiah would appear as a public minister. And this is exactly what it says. And after the 62 weeks, of course now you have to include the 7 weeks, it's 69 weeks. After that, sometime after that, it says he shall be cut off, but he will be without guilt. Now when is he going to be cut off? It says in verse 27, in the middle of the week. Two ways you have to understand this. First of all, he started his public ministry. It's supposed to last for seven years, but after three and a half years in the middle of it, of that last prophetic week, he was cut off. And as we pointed out, so he will, when he returns, complete the missing three and a half years of his ministry towards the children of the house of Israel. Our new book that points that out in great detail. But he was also cut off in the middle of the week, quite literally, on a Wednesday. He was crucified on a Wednesday. And we'll talk about that in detail in the next sermon. So putting it all together, 
and we are by far not the only ones who are understanding this, this is a prophecy talking about the public appearance of Jesus Christ in 27 AD, which would last for three and a half years, getting you to 31 AD, when he was actually crucified. And in this week, 31 AD, the day when he was arrested and tried and before he was laid into the grave was in fact a Wednesday. Because the first day of unleavened bread was in fact in that week, 31 AD, a Thursday, the first day of unleavened bread. Now one more comment, why does the Bible distinguish here between the one week and then the other 62 weeks, getting then to the, oh, what was it now, 60, yeah, two weeks and seven weeks, I'm sorry, it talks about seven weeks in chapter, in verse 25, and then 62 weeks. Why the distinguishing between those two figures? Now, the Ryrie Study Bible gives an interesting explanation. They say the 77ths begin with the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, the commandment of Artaxerxes. Except when you read that one, they have the wrong date then. But the point is, the public square and moat were rebuilt by the time the first seven weeks were completed. So apparently during the first seven weeks, the public square and the moat were rebuilt. Now if you didn't know what moat was or is, I had to check it out. A moat is a deep, broad ditch, which can be filled with water, doesn't have to be filled with water, that surrounds a building or a town. So that's what they did first. And that took some the first seven weeks, literally, I mean prophecy weeks. And then after that you add the 62. And putting it all together they have the 69 weeks, so one more time. The command was given in 457 BC to rebuild the city. You are adding 69 weeks or 483 years and you come to 27 AD. Now some are getting all confused just in passing, and they are saying, oh, well, this is not talking about the Messiah at all, this is talking about some kind of the beast power or the Antichrist, and he is going to have a seven-year contract with uh, whoever, the Arabs or the Jews or whatever, and then after three and a half years he breaks the contract. That's not what it's talking about. That's not what the church has ever preached. You know, why did, in the middle of the week, why did he bring an end to sacrifice and offering as we read? Because when Christ died, the sacrifices and the offerings were no longer necessary. When Christ died, the sacrifices were done away with. And Paul later told the Jews in the letter to the Hebrews that when the temple would be destroyed, which would happen. And of course, when we read that the people of the prince will come to destroy the city, that happened in 70 AD. You see, but Paul said, well, don't worry about it when the temple is being destroyed because the sacrifices are no longer necessary. Okay, having said this, we are still having a problem. Because if Christ, in fact, was born in 4 BC, which he had to, if he, in fact, was about 30 years old when he started his public ministry, and he did, as we see in a moment, how can this be? Because, you see, Herod, some books tell us, died in 4 BC. Now, if Herod died in 4 BC, and some even say in the springtime, and Christ was born in the fall, as we have seen, of 4 BC, then all the events which are being recorded in the Bible, including the murder of those children, two years and under, couldn't have taken place under Herod. See, I've always puzzled by that, frankly. You know, I, I kind of took it like, well, you know, Herod died in 4 BC, and I tried to reconcile my own mind, but how is that possible? And I thought, no, wait a minute, there's something wrong with this. There's got to be something wrong with it. And sure enough, here's what's wrong with it. You don't find anywhere in any history books or in archaeological records, and most certainly not in the Bible, that it's clearly stated when Herod died. Now, some concluded it was 4 BC based on something Josephus wrote. Josephus wrote in his books that when Herod died, there was a lunar eclipse. Now, astronomers have looked at the lunar eclipses and they have seen that in fact there was one in 4 BC. And so they concluded, okay, so therefore Herod then had to have died in that year. Meaning that Christ must have been born in 6 or 7 BC because they understood that after Christ was born all these events had to take place. However, 
There is nothing which proves that Herod was in fact born in 4 BC and in fact there were other lunar eclipses later on including in 1 BC. So when you go on the internet you will find that it's a high, highly disputed issue as to whether Herod died in 4 BC or in 1 BC. Let me just give you a few quotes. One quote says, Biblical chronologists generally date the capture of Jerusalem by Herod to 37 BC, the rebuilding of the temple as beginning in 20 BC, and Herod's death to either 4 BC or 1 BC. And then somebody says that Shabbat 2 is the traditional Jewish date for the death of Herod. Using a calendar computer program, Shabbat 2 is probably January 26 in 1 BC. Based upon the writing, somebody else wrote, of Josephus, which appeared to be mostly accurate, the anchor date of the war between Antony and Octavius Caesar and calculations of relevant lunar events, it appears that Herod the Great died on January 26, Shepard II, in 1 BC. Since the prophecy suggests that Jesus was born 4 BC, so this author had that right, if the date of the decree is 457 BC, and the author had that right, he being around two years old, Christ being around two years old, when Herod tried to kill him, because remember now, when the wise men came from the uh, east, and so they explained to Herod that they had seen the star, and Herod tried to find out exactly when they had seen that star, apparently an angel, and after that he concluded, I have to kill all the boys to and under, so Christ obviously was not just a little baby anymore. All that had to happen after, you know, the wise men didn't return back to Herod, and so it had to happen while Herod was still alive. So this also says, he being around two years old when Herod tried to kill him, this means that that attempt had to happen around 2 or 3 BC, then Herod's death has to happen thereafter. He is dying in 1 BC, that certainly fits it very well. And that seems to be the clear-cut answer. So it shows again how careful one has to be when one looks at some quote-unquote historical records giving you all the historical quote-unquote facts and when you dig into this you find out, wait a minute, where are the facts? It's all based on assumptions. Now let's turn to Luke chapter 3 and find that the Bible in fact confirms that Jesus was about 30 years old when he started his public ministry. Luke chapter 3 and in verse 23. Luke chapter 3 and verse 23. Now Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Heli, and so on. So he was about 30 years of age. And since we have established that it was around 27, or in 27 AD, so 30 years of age, his ministry lasted three and a half years, you know when he died. 31. Now, the fact that he was 30 years of age is important. Because let's go back to the book of Numbers and see that public offices, specifically re relating to the temple, relating to the tabernacle, were held by Levites who were 30 years old. In Numbers chapter 4, so 30 was actually a year of age which the Jews would look at necessary and also sufficient to start some kind of a public ministry. In Numbers chapter 4, and let's say verse 29, as for the sons of Merari, you shall number them by their families and by their father's house, from 30 years old and above, even to 50 years old, you shall number them, everyone who enters a service to do the work of the tabernacle of meeting. And then you can later look at verse 35, verse 39, verse 47. All of these scriptures show that they had to be about 30 years old. And so Christ was 30 years old when he started his public ministry. Now, we today in the Church of God are not bound by these figures. We are not ordaining somebody only between 30 and 50 and say, oh, if you're older than 50, you can't be ordained anymore. And we are not necessarily waiting until somebody is 30 years old. However, however, 
The experience has shown that it is a big mistake to ordain someone too young. In far too many cases, in times past, people have been ordained in their early 20s, even to the offices of evangelists. And many of them left the church subsequently. Others could never get rid of the pride which developed within them, because now they were something. They became haughty. It's dangerous. So there is one exception. See, in other words, Paul talks to Timothy. And he says to Timothy, nobody shall despise your youth. Now, we don't know how old Timothy was. Uh, I assume he was in his mid-twenties, maybe, which would have been a young person in the minds of the Jews, because after all, we just read about the 30 years. But that would be an exception. So, as I said, history has shown it is not wise to ordain someone to the office of an elder who is too young. Because the fruits overall, now there have been exceptions, but the fruits overall have been bad. Very bad. But let's go back to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. Because there's also something I need to point out later on in the sermon, that there is a need for ordinations. And especially in our church. In Matthew chapter 3, beginning in verse 13. Matthew chapter 3, beginning in verse 13. It says, Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now. For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he allowed him, and then Jesus, when he had been baptized, came up immediately from the water, or better, out of the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. That doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit looks like a dove. It was a vision, obviously. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So here we read about his baptism. Now what did the baptism do? He said, well, we have to do it to fulfill our righteousness. Sure, it was a, an example he gave to all of us today that we as those who want to become converted need to be baptized, need to be properly baptized with the laying on of hands by a minister of God in order to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Baptism after, of course, repentance and after faith in Christ's sacrifice, in the gospel of the kingdom of God, and so on. But was that all? Now we know that Jesus Christ had the Holy Spirit from inception in its, I mean, without any measure. We know that. But we also know that Christ did not perform any public miracle until after this event took place. And now notice something very interesting in the book of Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, beginning in verse 36. This is what Peter said. Acts chapter 10, beginning in verse 36. It says, The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all, that word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea, and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So it appears that when Christ was baptized, at that moment God gave him the extra power to perform miracles. Because as we have said, there is nothing in the Bible indicating he performed any miracle prior to that. And we also know that John the Baptist, who had the Holy Spirit from inception, didn't perform any miracle. Now Christ said he was the greatest of all men. He didn't perform any signs. So there are some who think they have to be able to perform signs so that they have the stamp of approval of God upon them. I'd rather be somebody like John the Baptist having the powers he had 
but not the power to perform miracles. You didn't have that. And still, Christ tells us that he was the greatest of all men. Of course, he said the one who is in the kingdom of God is greater than he, obviously, because he compared him with John the Baptist being a human being, not in the kingdom as a God being. Now, after Christ was baptized, what happened next? Let's go to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. We know the story, don't we? Beginning in verse 1. Then, after he was just baptized, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And then it says in verse 2, when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. And now when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, and now he also quotes scripture. But he quotes it out of context, and he quotes it with giving it a different twisted meaning. And that is what the ministers in this world are doing. And we have to be careful that we are not listening to them. Because here Satan is quoting scripture, giving it a totally distorted meaning. He says, oh, well, it says, she shall give his angels charge concerning you, and their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, it's also written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Don't put yourself in a stupid situation and then trying to force God to intervene on your behalf. That's not the way it works. And of course then the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and said glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you. Now it was Satan's to give, see. Satan is a god of this world. Satan rules this world. All the kingdoms, every single one of them, no matter in what nation you might be living, no matter under what country, under what government you shall be living, Satan rules them all. That's why we are not getting involved in politics. Many in other churches of God even have totally forgotten that point. And they think, oh, they should go out and vote in governmental elections. As if they could make a difference. What stupidity! But Satan says, oh, I give it to you. If you only worship me. Satan's desire has always been to be worshipped, you see. This was a temptation. Because, you see, he was telling Christ, you don't have to go through this trial, this problems, you know, dying. No, I'll give it to you now. What did Christ say? Away with you, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him alone you shall serve. And then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. The devil left him at that moment. He didn't leave him for the rest of Christ's life. No, he would come back. He would tempt him again and again and again. You can read this later in Luke chapter 4 and in verse 13 where it says Satan left him until an opportune time. So he would come back, but the point is at this time Christ had qualified. He had qualified for the kingdom of God. He had qualified to be the ruler. Now he would have to wait 2,000 years or so until he would come back to restore the kingdom of God here on this earth. But this was a gigantic spiritual battle where he defeated Satan after having fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And now he had qualified. And because he had qualified, he could do this. Matthew chapter 4, and notice in verse 17. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Why was it at hand now? Because Christ had qualified. Christ would come back as the king of that kingdom. And it was now possible for you and me, because he had qualified, to enter into that kingdom at the time of Christ's return. But he said, but you have to repent. You have to change your way of life. And then you will have access and can have access to the kingdom of God. And after he said that, 
after he began to preach. He didn't preach that before. You don't find that he preached, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand, before he started his public ministry, before he was baptized, before he had fasted, before he had disqualified Satan. So after that, in John chapter 1, and in further 35 till 51, he calls his disciples. John chapter 1, beginning in verse 35, and I don't want to read the whole passage, but beginning in verse 35 of John chapter 1, again the next day, after he had been baptized, John stood with two of his disciples. And looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And then, of course, the disciples come to Jesus, and then Jesus calls others. The point is, Jesus called the disciples. Jesus appointed people to members of his body, to officers in his church, to deacons, to elders. You know, some people, they appoint themselves. Some people declare that they are prophets because of some obscure, bizarre event which allegedly ordains them to the office of prophets. I mean, I laugh about this, I shake my head in unbelief, but then I am puzzled because there are actually people following a guy like that. That's something which is just beyond me. I can't get it. I mean, how totally out of this world you have to be. To, to believe that kind of a story. Others say, well, no, I am the anointed one. I am the prophet. People call the Pope your holiness. And on and on it goes. People call others, you know, ministers, quote unquote, reverend. These are all titles exclusively reserved for Christ. And people taking these titles to themselves. I would be scared to death to do that. Because you see, God isn't mocked. I mean, you take a title which only belongs to Christ and you apply to yourself, you think how God looks about that and thinks about that. Now, Christ has to appoint. Christ has to ordain. And Christ is putting you in the church where he wants you to be. And Christ is setting his name on certain feast sites. And you had better go where Christ placed his name. After all of this, we read about the first miracle the first miracle, the public miracle, in John chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, and you know that miracle. Water turned to wine. John chapter 2 and verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? That's not the best translation. The better translation is woman, and woman it was just a respectable way of addressing your mother. Woman, what can I do for you? That is a much better translation. But he also says, but think now, remember, my hour hasn't come yet. But nevertheless, Mary knew that he would do something, and so she tells the people, whatever he tells you to do, do. And of course, Christ changes the water into wine, and very expensive wine, very good wine. And so we read in verse 11. This beginning of science, see, that was the beginning. Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, and he manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. And after this he went down to Capernaum, he, his mother, his brothers, and his disciples. Some say, oh, when it talks about Christ's brothers, it's just talking about his disciples. No, he has a clear-cut distinction. The disciples believed in him. His brothers didn't believe in him at that time. And here it's clearly stated, his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, they all went together to Capernaum, and they didn't stay there many days. So this was his first miracle. And then following this, in John chapter 2, beginning in verse 13, it says, now the Passover of the Jews was at hand. Now this was the Passover of A.D. 28. Because remember now, he was baptized in October of A.D. 27. So this had to be now the next Passover, Passover of A.D. 28. Now it says the Passover of the Jews because for several reasons. First of all, when John wrote this, the symbols had been changed. 
At that time, you didn't have to offer and sacrifice a lamb anymore. See, Christ had already changed the symbols for us, but see, when it came to the Jews, they would still go by the Old Testament Passover. And on top of that, of course, they had added all kinds of traditions, which are not in the Bible at all. At all. And so that is the term, the Passover of the Jews. This doesn't mean that you don't have to keep the Passover anymore. What it means is we keep the Passover today with the new symbols which Jesus Christ instituted. The foot washing and the bread and the wine. But here the Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And when he found in the temple, verse 14, those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business, and when he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple. Now rightly understood, he didn't hit the people. He hit the animals, getting them out, but he also thrust out the people. With the sheep and the oxen, better, he drove them out of the temple, namely the sheep and the oxen, that's how it should be rendered, and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away, do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. That's a house, that's a temple. You see, now the point is, this was the temple which had originally been created or rebuilt under, you know, Ezra, Nehemiah and so on. But Herod later had enlarged it, beautified it. Herod, that, that evil king, nevertheless. Christ refers to it as my father's house. Important for this reason. You read later in 2 Thessalonians that the man of sin will be in the temple of God, saying that he is God. And some say, oh, that had to be the church, because, you know, God would never refer to a physical temple as the temple of God. Well, of course he does. He does right here. You see, if it was dedicated by the Jews, and it will be, and we have this series in our Q&As on the fact that in all likelihood, in all probability, the Jews will still build a temple prior to Christ's return. And it is this temple where that man of sin, a pope, I'm not saying who, a pope will be claiming to be God, and he's coming with the power of Satan, as you read in 2 Thessalonians. Now, what is interesting here about this is that Christ did it at least twice. Now, here we find that he did it, as we have just read, in AD 28 at the Passover. But he did a second cleansing, doing the same thing just prior to his death, a couple of years later. And you read that, for instance, in Matthew chapter 21. In Matthew chapter 21. So obviously they didn't get the lesson the first time, so he had to do it a second time. Matthew chapter 21 and verse 12. Now when you read the entire chapter, you see that is at the time when he just entered Jerusalem, his triumphal entry, it says, just prior to his arrest. And we read in Matthew 21 and verse 12, and then Jesus went out or went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple, overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he says the same thing again. And you find another parallel scripture in Mark chapter 11, verses 15 to 18. So he did it at least twice. Now we will later read in the next sermon, when we are talking about the anointing of Jesus, you know, when the woman comes to anoint him, that happened at least three times by three different women. But I will explain that next time. But here the cleansing of the temple happened twice. Now, continuing in John chapter 3, beginning of verse 1, we read the very interesting discussion between Jesus and Nicodemus. It says here, chapter 3 and verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus by night, and then they're talking about born again. And if there's one issue in Orthodox Christianity which is most confusing to people, it's the issue of born again. And people are saying, when you receive the Holy Spirit, you're already born again. 
Now, in this particular case, in John chapter 3, Christ indeed is talking about being born again at the time when you enter the kingdom of God as a spirit being. Because he points out, if you are, whatever is of the flesh is flesh. Whatever is of the spirit is spirit. When you are born again, you are spirit. Are you spirit today? I mean, you cut yourself, you find out real quick whether you are spirit today or you're not spirit today. Paul says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. John says in here, quoting Christ, you know, you have to be born again in order to be able to see the kingdom of God. God in his glory. You can see God in his glory, except in a vision perhaps. But you will see him as a spirit being. So here he's talking about born again. But he's also pointing out that you have to be born out of water and the spirit. In other words, yes, he is referring first to baptism. Baptism is a part of it. But baptism is necessary but not sufficient. You have to be baptized. You have to receive the Holy Spirit. But that doesn't make you born again. That makes you begotten of the Holy Spirit. And then you have to continue your way of overcoming until you become born again when Christ returns and you are being placed into the kingdom of God. Something the church of God at one time understood and now it's all confused by so many groups today. In the Greek the word is genau. It's one word. But the word can mean begotten, the word can mean born, and the word can refer to the process from begotten to born. It's up to, to the translator what to use. And of course, if the translator doesn't understand it, as in most cases they don't, they use the wrong words. And sometimes they use the word begotten when it should be born. And sometimes they use the word born when it should be begotten. Now you, with God's spirit, should understand the context. And you should understand when it says begotten, that that's what it should say or shouldn't say, no matter, I mean, depending on what the context is. So here he is talking about you have to be born again to enter the kingdom of God, but in order to become born again, you have to be begotten first. It is interesting, you're looking at the timeline, that he is in all likelihood having this discussion around Pentecost, around Pentecost of 28 AD. Because if you keep going, in John chapter 4, you read in verse 35. See, this is shortly thereafter. John chapter 4 and verse 35. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Now he's talking about the fall harvest here. He's talking about the fall season, beginning with the Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement. And then, of course, the Feast of Tabernacles, the last great day. Are you still not saying, you're saying, oh, there's four months, and it comes to harvest. You go back four months, it gets you around Pentecost. But he says, Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. Deep spiritual meaning attached to this. Yes, the big harvest is going to occur during the Feast of Tabernacles. In other words, the millennium. The Feast of Tabernacles picturing the fall harvest, the millennium. But there's already a harvest to be have now. Pentecost. That's when you and I, the first fruits, are to, supposed to be harvested. You know, Christ being the first of the first fruits, but we are the first fruits. The main harvest is coming later. But Christ is saying here, there's already a harvest to be held. So don't say, oh, we'll wait until the millennium comes. Work is over now. We don't have to preach the gospel anymore. We just wait for Christ's return. No, you do the work now. And you see, in this context, notice what Christ is saying in Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. Beginning at verse 37. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. 
But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered, like sheep having no shepherd. And he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Taking those scriptures together, we are to pray to God that he will bring ministers into his church. There is a need for ordinations. And we have said from the outset, it appears that we have to build up our own people within our own group because it doesn't look like that ministers from other churches will join us. And quite frankly, at this point, I don't know that I would feel comfortable about that because there is so much confusion going on in these other groups. I mean, we would have to carefully look into what these guys are teaching now. What do they believe now? You know? What we need to do is we need to understand that Christ is grooming certain people for ordinations. And I want you to keep praying earnestly, like he is telling us here to do. Pray that God will bring laborers into his harvest. There's a great need in the church right now for that. A great need. Most of our ministers are getting older. You know, we're looking, at, I don't want to identify anyone, I mean, I would never do this, I mean, I would not uh, uh, refer to somebody in Canada or somebody in Great Britain or somebody in Colorado, see, I wouldn't identify those people by name, uh, but they're getting older. Myself, I'm getting, not younger, I'm turning 60 in May. Now, you look at me as, as young as I look, you might be really surprised, but that's true, I mean, I'm going to be tur turning 60 in May, and even though... Uh, I don't feel like 60, maybe 58 or whatever. Nevertheless, you know, you do slow down after a while. So we do need young blood. Not too young, as I said, but young blood. And, and we got to pray to God that he will make that possible and that he will inspire the ministry to see where the candidates are. And um, it takes that very seriously. But, you know, we are going to continue with this church. And once I am gone, whenever that's going to be, and hopefully I will, you know, experience Christ's return, but you know, hey, Mr. Armstrong felt that way too, and then he had to understand it's a very, in the very, very later years that he wouldn't. You know, somebody got to carry it on. So anyhow, that's what Christ is talking about here. And that's an ongoing commission, an ongoing challenge to all of us. See, this happens here now in the second half of AD 28, after John the Baptist was imprisoned when he comes to Galilee. Now, in your, if you go to John chapter 5, beginning at verse 1, we find another milestone in Christ's public ministry. John chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. And after this there was, it should be the, not a, the feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. What feast was that? Chrono chrono Based on chronology, chronologically, I meant to say, this was in fact the Feast of Trumpets, of AD 29. It still says a feast of the Jews because, you know, today we don't quite keep the feast of trumpets the way the Jews do. I mean, we don't blow literal trumpets, but we are spiritual trumpets, aren't we? We are proclaiming as the spiritual trumpets of God the trumpet message. Cry aloud, spare not, lift your voice like a trumpet, show my people their transgressions and their sins, we read. So the interesting thing is what Christ is doing here, what's happening here on the Feast of Trumpets in 21 AD. He heals somebody. He heals somebody and then, of course, he's being accused in verse 10. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, it is the Sabbath. It's not lawful for you to carry your bed. See, it wasn't just a weekly Sabbath, it was a holy day too. Double problem for the Jews. You mean you are healing somebody on the weekly Sabbath, which also is a holy day? No, I'm not saying that this necessarily was a weekly Sabbath. What I'm saying is this was a holy day. It was a holy Sabbath. The Feast of Trumpets. 
And so later on in verse 14, Christ finds him and he says to him, See, you have been made well, sin no more, lest the worst thing may come upon you. An admonishment Christ is giving time and again. He was telling this to the woman caught in adultery later on. He said, well, if, if nobody has condemned you, I won't condemn you either, but you sin no more. Sin no more. That's the point. In other words, we need to concentrate on the fact that we have to change our lives. Now, that's not always easy. I mean, you might have known people, I've known people, and you might be part of that category, and I might be part of the category, where we're struggling with certain habits throughout our life. But you see, the point is we have to be willing to overcome and then we have to ask God for help to overcome. And God will look at the heart and he will see whether we mean it or whether we are just playing games. Now, this was at the Feast of Trumpets when all of this happened. And you see, interesting enough, is what Christ is saying. Verse 21 of chapter 5. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, verse 22. He goes on to say in verse 24, Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him, who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Verse 25, most assuredly I say to you, the hour is coming and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. It's a trumpet's message. It's a message of Christ's return. It's the last trumpet when people will be resurrected, when people will be changed, when people will come out of their graves. Enter eternal life. Verse 26, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. Verse 29, they will come forth, those who have done good, to the resurrection of life. Well, of course, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation or better judgment, that's going to come during the great white throne judgment period. Now, people didn't accept it, as people don't accept it today. And notice what Christ says to them. First in verse 37, he says, the Father himself, who sent me, has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his form. You see, but people have seen the form of God in the Old Testament. They have heard his voice, proving that the one whom they saw in the Old Testament wasn't the Father, but Jesus Christ. He goes on to say in verse 38, But you didn't have his word abiding in you, because whom he sent, him you do not believe. Verse 39, you search the scriptures, for in them you think that you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me, talking about Old Testament scriptures, saying they testify of me. The entire Old Testa Testament testifies of me, Jesus Christ. He's telling the Jews at then, he's telling the Jews today, and nobody seems to be listening. Verse 45, do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father, there is one who accuses me, Moses or accuses you rather, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So the flip side of the coin is true too, talking to Orthodox Christians today who reject the writings of Moses. Christ says, well, if you don't believe him, you can't believe me either giving a strong condemnation to Orthodox Christians who reject the Old Testament, including the Ten Commandments, including the Sabbath, including the Holy Days, including all the laws in the Old Testament, which we still have to keep today. It's not a popular message which Christ gave then. In fact, they were so upset they wanted to stone him for it. It's not a popular message we are preaching today. But what does Paul say? Woe unto me if I don't do it. We could have easy lives, we could become more and more part of the society, or becoming more and more part of a social club. That's not what God had in mind. That's not why God called us into his body. In John chapter 6, we read that at a later time, Christ is feeding 5,000. 
Now, looking at all of this, it's happening again at the Passover time. This time it has to be now early 30 AD. Because what do we read? John chapter 6 and verse 1. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, that a great multitude followed him because they saw a signs which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Verse 4, now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. And now he feeds the 5,000. Turns, you know, a little bit bread into lots of bread. Again, now we are talking about the Passover of 30 AD being near. So now we have reached already the year 30 AD. Now, of course, later on people would look for him. And Christ says, well, you're not looking for him because you want to hear my words. You're looking for him because you've seen how I fed people with bread. And that's why you're coming. In other words, you're not really coming to me because you want to do my will. You're coming to me because you want to be part of a social club, let's say. People should really think twice, or three times, or maybe ten times, when they make decisions. What's their motives? What is their motives? Do they really want to follow God? Or do they have other motives? I like to go to Matthew chapter 17. We are still in the year 30 AD. But here comes another benchmark event in the life of Christ. Now we've just read about what happened just prior to Passover. Now, as I will show you, we are jumping now to the Feast of Tabernacles, still in AD 30. Still in AD 30. Matthew 17, very famous passage. His transfiguration on the mount. Another one which has just basically confused many, many people. Before we read chapter 17 and verse 1, let's go back to chapter 16, verse 28, where we read that Christ says, Surely I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So that is the introduction. So he, say, he says, well, there are some who are not going to die until they see me as a glorified being in the kingdom of God. Now, chapter 17, verse 1. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, brought them up on a high mountain by themselves, and was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, his clothes became as white as a light, and behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Now this was, as I show you, as I will show you, a vision. Now they were not really there. See, Christ wasn't really already a glorified being. Moses and Elijah weren't already glorified beings speaking to him at that moment. They were dead in the grave. It's a vision. Christ is showing them what will happen in the kingdom of God. Because he says, remember, some will see me in my glorified form before the kingdom of God comes. Uh, will, will see me in the kingdom of God before they die. So that's what he's doing now. He's showing them in the vision how it's going to be. And Peter answered and said to Jesus in verse 4, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles. Why would he say that? Because it was during the Feast of Tabernacles when this happened. So we're going to make three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And while he was speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, hear him. And when the disciples heard him, they fell on their faces, were greatly afraid. Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, do not be afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus alone. Notice verse 9. Now as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision. Well, here it's very clear. It should be clear to anyone who reads that what he what he is describing here is a vision. Now tell the vision no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Some say, oh, well, this proves that Moses and Elijah are alive someplace. And they are already kind of glorified beings. And, and so 
No, it's not proving this at all. See, Christ is the firstborn from the dead. Christ wasn't even dead yet. Christ wasn't even resurrected yet. Now it's talking about a vision showing them what is going to happen during the millennium. And the Feast of Tabernacles is picturing the millennium. And Peter, in his amazement, said, okay, let's, let's build those, those tabernacles quick. You know, because that's what they were doing during the Feast of Tabernacles. All right, now let's go to the last passage I want to quote today in John chapter 7. Because at the end of the Feast of Tabernacles, when the last great day began, during the last great day, Jesus made another interesting statement. See, we're still talking about A.D. 30. But now that's the last great day of A.D. 30. John chapter 7, beginning in verse 37. On the last day, that great day of the feast, we call it today the last great day. This is not talking about the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. That wasn't even a Sabbath. Now we are talking about the last great day, an annual holy day, an annual Sabbath. And here's a message. On that last great day, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. See, that's not true for us today. Today you have to be called. You have to be predestined to be called in this day and age. And God only calls very few today. The spring harvest we read about. See, today it's not true that just anybody who wants to come to Christ can come to Christ. No, Christ got a call. Christ says, nobody can come to me unless the Father draws him. But it's going to be true during the last great day period because then salvation is going to be offered to everybody. Offered to everybody. They still have to make a decision. But so he says here, if anyone thirsts, the message of the last great day, let him come to me and drink. And he who believes in me, as the scriptures have said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet. The word given is added, it's not in the original. The Holy Spirit didn't exist yet. Because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now are you saying there was no Holy Spirit? Of course we are not saying that. The Holy Spirit of the Father was in Jesus. Everything Jesus did, he did through the power of the Holy Spirit of the Father being in him. But you see, the Holy Spirit of Christ wasn't there yet. Because in order to give the Holy Spirit, you've got to be a glorified being. And Christ wasn't glorified yet. What Christ is talking about is, when the time comes, the Spirit of the Father and of me will come to you. And that's why Christ says, you know, you believe me, you love me, the Father will love you, and we will come and have our abode within you. This proves, by the way, that the Holy Spirit is not a person, and that the concept of the Trinity is wrong. But this is the message. Now first we've got to have the first fruits. First we've got to be called by God, we have to receive the Holy Spirit, because we are going to be the ones ruling under Christ under Christ in the millennium and then doing the great white throne judgment to help all the other people to come to the truth as well. And this was a message he gave on the last great day in AD 30. Now next time I will speak about the events which took place in AD 31 and will also show that with Christ's death and resurrection the work of the church hasn't stopped just the opposite. The work has really begun and we are continuing in that work.